It's a beautiful day. Lucky that we live Hawaii Nay. 24-7-365. Swimming in the ocean anytime. Take a leap. Aloha and welcome to this episode of Foundations for Healthy Generations. I'm Tammy Swart and I'm working in the Office of Communications at the Department of Health. And today we're going to be talking about the Office of Language Access with some special guests in the, in the studio today. And with us today we've got Dr. Serafin June Colmenares and you are the Executive Director of the Office of Language okay. Access. <coughs> and we also have the Chair of the Language Advisory Committee mm -hmm. for OLA. Uh, Dominic uh, Inoselda. Yes. Uh, Welcome today. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. Thank you. So the Office of Language Access, or OLA, mm -hmm. is fairly new uh, to the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know you both have extensive backgrounds in public health and in the community. Um, would you mind for a moment just taking a moment to tell us more about yourself and your background? Well, um, in my case, I'm actually an immigrant from the Philippines, and uh, my family and I came to Hawaii in. 1987 oh. and my background is actually political science but then when I <coughs> when I work at the Hawaii Medical Services uh, Association or HMSA um, I was working on uh, the Medicaid program and that actually introduced me you know to the to the to the field public health yeah and I decided to take my master's in public health from the University of Hawaii and in fact, my, my field study was on the uh, mental health of Vietnamese women refugees in, in Hawaii, hmm. okay? Now from uh, HMSA, um, I worked for a short time with the uh, um, Catholic Charities of Hawaii and the uh, Lanakila Easy Access uh, Project. Then I was hired by the Hawaii Community Foundation to be the program officer for health, medical research, and aging. Um, a few years after that, I went to the Department of Health uh, and in the Executive Office on Aging. And I stayed there for about uh, six years, I think. When the Office of Language Access was created, they plucked me out <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, uh, made me the Executive Director of that office. So my passion really is, you know, um, to help the marginalized uh, people in, in society, especially the immigrants, because they need a lot of help. And I'm hoping that uh, the Office of Language Access will be able to do that. Great, thank you. And Dominic? Actually, I grew up here in Hawaii, actually in Waipahu. I was born in California, though, but grew up most of my life in Waipahu. So I've seen a lot of changes. I went to August Orange School with a lot of uh, Filipino friends, Japanese friends, and a mixture of all kinds of groups. Um, and then I um, went on to high school at Waipawa High School, graduated in 1968, and I went in the military for four years in the Air Force. And I learned a lot from that experience in terms of mingling with a larger group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, that experience um, let me think about going to college. So I went to Leeward Community College for two years and on to uh, Manoa for two years. And I got a sociology degree. And it was like, okay, what can you do with a sociology degree? Um, so I did some jobs. Um, and then um, I had uh, one more year left in my GI Bill. So I went, I applied for the School of Social Work. And I, I completed the MSW program there. Um, after that, I went to, uh, I was doing a practicum at Susanna Wesley Community Center, and Nobu Yonamini, who was the exec at that time, uh, asked me if I would come to the agency to run the immigrant services program. So I did that for many years, and then slowly developed into a, a mental health um, bilingual program, working case management with uh, limited non-English speaking persons with uh, mental illness. And I've been there for about 30 something years, getting close to retirement now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And as far as your role uh, <coughs> on the Language Advisory Committee? Yes, um, I, al I also am the um, um, chair for the Language Ac the, uh, Advisory Council for Office of Language Access, and also I'm the uh, president for the Interagency Council for Immigrant Services. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously there is a need for these services, regardless of which organization uh, people might be in. Uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about OLA and uh, your roles there today? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, the language access law for, for the state of Hawaii was passed mm. in 2006. And uh, one of its uh, provisions is the creation of the Office of Language Access. So the office was established in 2007. And uh, basically, um, the um, purpose of the Office of Language Access, I mean, according to the law, is to exercise oversight and control, uh, and central coordination, I mean, um, to state agencies in the implementation of their language access plans. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, OLA is uh, mandated to provide technical assistance to state agencies as well as what we call as uh, covered entities. These are agencies that are receiving money from the state. That includes actually county agencies, nonprofit agencies, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, we also are <coughs> mandated to monitor uh, state agencies uh, in terms of their compliance with the law. We're basically a compliance office, okay? We also resolve complaints that may be filed by <coughs> limited English proficient individuals uh, insofar as the provision of language access uh, services uh, are concerned. Um, and uh, at the same time, we provide education as well as outreach activities because we believe that uh, mm -hmm. not agencies, state agencies, and other um, uh, state-funded agencies need to know what their responsibilities are under the law. And at the same time, the members of the of, uh, society, especially the LEP population, they have to know what their rights are under the law. <coughs> now, recently there was um, Act 217, which was passed by the Hawaii State Legislature, and that has given the office an additional uh, function of uh, uh, operating a language access resource center and a multilingual website. And <coughs> in terms of um, um, staffing, originally OLA had six uh, staff members, but this dwindled down to one. You know, in you? 2000, yeah, only <laughs> myself. <laughs> uh, as a result of the 2009, you know, economic uh, wow. downturn. So it was basically a one-man office mm -hmm. for more than two years. And wow. it was only in 2011, um, you know, when the new administration came in that they decided to give me back two of my uh, staff positions. So there are three of us right now. It still is not enough to, you know, to, to do all the functions that we're supposed to do. And so I'm hoping that, you know, um, sooner or later, <laughs> we will be able to get those uh, lost positions. And once you do, is that when you're going to you know, concentrate more on development of the new center you were talking about and the website? And the, uh, the law actually provides uh, additional uh, staffing oh. for, the, for that uh, language access resource center as well as multilingual website. So uh, we will be getting three more people from that, I mean for that program. Great. And uh, that creates problem of space actually <laughs> oh yeah because right now we're still at the Department of Labor and um, the space that we have there is only I think good for five people oh, okay. and you know so with the three right now and then with the three additional mm -hmm. people six of us we need additional space uh, with the transition from Department of Labor to Ola being under Department of Health mm -hmm. do you you know, maybe see that not becoming such an issue once you get your staff. Are you going to be physically moving over, or will you stay in the same location? Uh, well, right now <coughs> we're staying there because there's no there's no uh, you know vacant space that ah. that we can find actually. Okay. So we'll see what happens. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. um, did you have anything else about Ola and how? Well, um, as I mentioned, uh, restoring the three positions that we lost is actually uh, you know. Uh, uh, shall we say, um, uh, 
a very important mm -hmm. uh, shall we say objective of the of the office so that we will be able to really perform or do the functions the original functions that we were supposed to do uh, for example compliance monitoring we we have difficulty doing that because we don't have the manpower to you know because it, it needs people to go out and monitor agencies um, we cannot also meet the requests for technical assistance mm. from the 26 state agencies as well as from the almost 100 you know state funded agencies wow. that wow. would require our help okay and um, Act 217, which created the Language Access Resource Center, um, was passed recently, but it only gave us uh, less than half of the funds that we requested. So um, uh, that would not uh, make us, you know, um, or that would actually prevent us from really performing all the things that the resource center was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. you know. So we hope that uh, in the future we will be able to get those additional resources. Okay, um, we are committed to performing the, the functions that uh, has been given to us, and uh, so far, you know, we have enjoyed the support, the strong support from the Language Access uh, <coughs> Advisory Council, mm -hmm. and and the community at large. We also have the support of the legislature, of course, for passing uh, the law. And of course, the governor who has been all out actually for language access. So we, we thank all of them. And of course, the Department of Health for welcoming <laughs> us. <laughs> Th we thank you for being. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, you, you talk about providing direct line uh, technical support to so yes. many agencies. Is that in the form of providing translation services or? Well, uh, we're not actually providing direct services in terms of uh, interpretation or translation uh -huh. uh, services. What we do is, uh, for example, the law requires um, <coughs> all state agencies as well as uh, the so-called uh, covered entities to um, establish their language access plans. Oh, These okay. plans, you know, uh, set up the, the, the procedures that they have to follow in providing uh, language services like interpretation and translation to the LEP population. So sometimes they have uh, difficulty coming up with a plan. So we, you know, we provide the necessary technical assistance on how to come up with a plan and you know um, sometimes they would uh, ask us uh, if we know certain uh, procedures being followed by other states mm -hmm. or other agencies especially in the mainland so we provide them with information yeah Great. so and um, <coughs> uh, they, they need also training for example how to deal with interpreters so we provide them training on that also hmm. A whole other aspect of things you might not consider otherwise, mm -hmm. but that could definitely yes. impact the accessibility to programs mm -hmm. for some people. And in addition to that, uh, we realized that, okay, we need uh, interpreters and translators, but what the law requires is that they should be competent interpreters, okay? So we realized that there's a need to train our existing interpreters, so we provide also the training for them. Wow. Yeah. So it's another full thing. To, yeah, <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Dominic, what types of activities do you uh, take part in with the the council itself? Actually, I'm the uh, um, the uh, advisor um, chair. Right. And operate the monthly meetings. Okay. Make sure we um, are addressing concerns that come up to us through the community or through the office, and um, the one to say. The members in the council have been very helpful, especially when we lost all the staff. Yes. The council pretty much helped in mm -hmm. staffing some and, and volunteering here and there. So I was very fortunate to have a whole good group of people that really have a, at heart mm -hmm. the um, willingness to ensure that people can communicate um, and, and get their needs met through public uh, services as well as um, sometimes private. Um, so that's kind of what I do, and mm -hmm. just keeping tabs with June whenever things are coming up, like like today, uh, to kind of be a uh, supporter in the work that we do together. And you mentioned you do find a lot of uh, issues brought forward during your meetings uh, mm -hmm. from the public and from other panel members. Mm -hmm. uh, so that definitely sounds like it adds a lot to the program. Uh, yes, we actually we get a lot of feedback from the council members. Um, yeah, um, interpretation translation is a real skill. Right. Uh, it's not something you just 
do because you pick people off the street and they speak another language. Um, how to uh, be in a situation where you're making sure that the needs of the person in front of you is, are being heard rather than the, interp the uh, interpreter's needs and, and what they're seeing. Um, making sure that there's a clarity of uh, content uh, without a lot of additional information that shouldn't be there and the role in the um, ethics of the um, interpreter is very important. And um, so it's not something you just do. You know, it takes a lot of skill. And, and the training that uh, the office is offering is really helping to develop uh, a group of trained interpreters that are competent, um, that know what they're doing. And then the other side of that is actually using the how to utilize the interpreters so that you can maximize and, and become more efficient um, and not miscommunicate even with the use of an interpreter. So those are all important pieces that I think we um, have a, um, a mission to provide for. And I think each of the members in that council are very supportive of that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I never would have thought of all the different uh, you know, details that go along with that. Uh -huh. uh, what are some of the <coughs> issues people have had, maybe some of the barriers or mm. uh, issues accessing the programs people are entitled to if they don't, you know, if they speak another language yeah. um, that you've encountered even before OLA existed? Yeah. Well, I, I've been in the field since 80, uh, 79 when I first started working with um, direct immigrant population. And um, through the years, I've seen a lot of things. At a certain point of time, there were quite a number of agencies doing immigrant services work through the um, uh, former uh, State Immigrant Service Center, and then it became the Office of Community Services. And for a while there, we did have quite a number of bilingual staff in the field who were actually immigrants could go to the office and get help, uh, bring their correspondence, try to understand the system. So it was very daunting to you know, ad navigate the system. Um, but eventually that system kind of focused more on employment rather than just general immigrant work. <coughs> so um, during that time, uh, that was basically the resource. And then within, say, the state agencies and stuff, sometimes they had staff who spoke another language and could assist. Um, but most times uh, they were asked to bring family members who could speak English Sometimes the little children would interpret for their parents. Wow. Um, at times, it, it got so frustrating, people just walked away. I mean, because there was no way to communicate. It was frustrating for the provider as well as the, the, mm -hmm. Im the immigrant person because they didn't have a system. And so we're developing a system, and I think it's making a real dent. Uh, you know, there are more trained interpreters out in the field. I think people understand their roles as, as interpreters and then moving towards translation services. And the website that's coming up, I think, is going to be really helpful. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's so hard to think about all of the potentially lost, you know, services that people could have had mm -hmm. access to just because mm -hmm. of that. It's so good that such a formalized process is now coming into fruition mm -hmm. and that, that OLA exists now and that the, the <coughs> advisory council exists. Mm -hmm. Uh, and obviously you all are doing a very good job, uh, a, an exemplary job. Um, I realized that June, you actually received an award this past year uh, for on behalf of yourself and your staff for excellence. Um, could you tell us a little more about that, please? <coughs> yeah, that, was, that award was really unexpected because I did not even know that I was, you know. Nominated. Nominated. Mm -hmm. uh, oh <laughs> yeah, uh, but that was the uh, William J. Harris uh, Equal Opportunity Award that's given annually by the National Association of uh, State uh, Agencies, uh, Workforce Agencies, NASWA, okay? And um, uh, it's named actually after uh, a former uh, director of the Civil Rights Center of the Department of Labor. And it's being given to uh, agencies or individuals who have uh, helped uh, promote uh, equal opportunity and uh, non-discrimination in the workforce. So. Um, well, um, I was I was honored, but uh, I don't know if I deserved it. <laughs> but uh, I accepted it on behalf mm -hmm. of the staff, you know, the, the advisory, advisory council, council and, the and, and the, yeah. uh, the department, of course, and uh, 
Uh, and of course, I, I accepted it for the state, you know, and mm -hmm. the people uh, here. And uh, it certainly um, uh, inspired me, and I think the staff, to mm -hmm. uh, continue what we're doing to help the LEP population in, in Hawaii. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that will uh, help uh, boost, you know, the, uh, the intent and, uh, and uh, to really help this population that uh, really needs a lot of help. I'll give you a lot of forward momentum in 2014 mm -hmm. to, to really yes. push forward. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And speaking of 2014, uh, in 2013, did you want to talk about any programs that you uh, had over the past year and maybe what <coughs> we could look forward to in 2014? Um, well, 2013, um, uh, some of the things that we did, uh, we had uh, the, of course, we have the annual language access conference that we hold every every August, and then I think uh, we we also had the the training for uh, community interpretation. I think we were able to train about twenty nine people mm -hmm. speaking twelve languages. You know, wow, yeah, in that in that particular training, and uh, we we continued actually uh, every year, almost every year, we we do this uh, training for the agencies so that their their staff, especially their bilingual staff, are aware of <coughs> you know the uh, the requirements of the law as well as uh, the um, the ethics uh, mm -hmm. involved, how they can work with interpreters and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And uh, um, we also passed uh, the legislation that uh, resulted in the establishment of the Language Access Resource Center, as well as the multilingual uh, website, and of course the the transfer of the department, I mean of the of the agency from the Department of Labor to the Department of Health, which we felt was uh, really uh, good because uh, the you know the mm -hmm. I think the mission uh, of the agency as well as the Department of Health uh, are more or less you know uh, congruent. Yeah. So it's a good. I think it was a good move. Uh, for this coming year, um, um, we have uh, lined up several uh, uh, activities. Actually, um, we're going to have that uh, medical terminology training. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually it starts on January yeah, 18th. Month, yeah, yeah. Oh. it's a 20-hour, five weekend uh, training for uh, medical terminology. And then we're also going to have a training for uh, <coughs> medical interpreters, the Bridging the Gap uh, training uh, in Maui, Maui wow. Memorial Hospital. And uh, then, of course, we're planning already the, the August conference mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else? Uh, Staffing. Yeah, I forgot to mention that we actually held an outreach uh, project uh, just this year. And it was, um, it was a partnership with the Office of Civil Rights the Department oh, yeah. of Health and Human mm -hmm. Services, uh, Region 9, uh, based in San Francisco. Oh. So what we did, because they themselves, they wanted uh, people in Hawaii actually to, to know more about what they're doing in terms of language access. And so we partnered, because we also wanted you mm -hmm. know uh, people to know <coughs> what OLA is and so on and so forth. So we went, it's statewide. We went from one island to another. Yeah, and it was... Uh, was fun. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, um, what else? Of course, um, uh, we have requested for the release of the funds for the Language Access uh, Resource Center and the multilingual website. So as soon as that's approved, then we can get the staffing, and uh, we're looking forward to the establishment of the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to look for that in 2014, and I'm very excited yes, about it. Yes. Yeah. Well, and for more information, I yeah. I'm you sorry. Go ahead. To no, I, I, I just. You know, we're continuing to do our work, mm -hmm. and I think one of the dreams w we always had as an advisory council, and I'm sure June, is to be a state that could model um, how to do language um, services better. And this whole effort has been very educational for a lot of us, um, a lot of input from various people, and I think we're moving ahead. I mean, we're doing a lot of good work. Um, the agencies that need interpreters now have at least access to some trained interpreters and they know how much, they have a sense of how much they pay them, how they make the connections, and we're creating this um, 
a listing. Uh, we're working on this list of in interpreters that people can contact, oh. so that uh, they know that they have trained people um, that they uh, ac have access to. So that's a big step that we have yeah. not had before. It was a basically who you knew, and you know some interpreter that maybe didn't have any training but you just brought them in because you needed them. Now at least there's a place you can go to where you know they had some training, they have the ethics, and they have some understanding about the interaction that goes on. So it's a plus. That's great. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw a listing, uh, you know, of the various languages that mm -hmm. we might encounter here, mm -hmm. and there are just so many that, that there's mm -hmm. definite need for a formalized and structured process to yeah. have access to those interpreters. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much for joining us, and uh, we could go to your website for more information mm -hmm. on the programs, and uh, I definitely look forward to seeing what Ola has in store for the mm -hmm. new year then. So thank you both for joining us. You're welcome, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> and as I said, you can visit the Ola website for more information, and uh, you know, if you've missed part of today's episode or want to see past episodes as well, you can also go to our website and go to the bottom right-hand corner and click on the link and you can catch the Foundation's episodes that have been recorded thus far. So thank you so much for joining us and mahalo and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Gotta get up. It's a beautiful day. Lucky that we live Hawaii 24-7, 365. Swimming in the ocean anytime. Take a leap.